Hi, this is Lou, welcome to my channel. And today I'm doing a little line and wash painting of Cly Smokehouse in Norfolk. I recently went on a trip there and I came back with lots of inspiration for things to paint. Um, and I'm sure I'll get to them in the next few weeks. But when I saw this building, I knew I wanted to do this. I love the sloping roof and the quirkiness of it. So that's what I'm gonna start with. I'm working in my moleskin watercolor notebook and I've picked a selection of colours. I've basically picked some of my favourite colours that I like to work with. So I've got Payne's Grey, Quinacridone Gold, Alizarin Crimson, and Buff Titanium, which is a really kind of creamy colour. I also added in some Viridian, but if you don't have any of these colours, then don't worry. Pick a bright pink, a bluey green, a warm yellow, and a brown and you'll get something quite close to what I'm working with. I'm going to start with a pencil sketch, just sketching in the basic shapes, um, trying to get the proportions right. I'm doing a little kind of measuring with my pencil just to make sure that I get the height and the width kind of about right. And then I'll put in a few details with the pencil, but uh, I won't uh, do too much. So I'm putting in some lines for the building next door um, because I want that to be in the picture. Um, I'm not going to focus on it, uh, but I want it to be there. And then I'm just marking in where the shop sign and the windows and, and things like that are going to be. And one thing I spend a little bit of time on is trying to work out how the stairs fit in. Um, and I. I get the kind of the basic placement with a pencil and then I do a little bit more uh, when I go in with a pen just to try and get the, the angles right for each of the steps and you'll, you'll see me working on that in a, in a short while. So now I'm going in with a pen. The pen I'm using is a Unipin fine liner. It's a 0.3 nib. Uh, the important thing is that it's got permanent waterproof ink so I can put watercolour over the top of it. There are plenty of other brands of pens. Uh, these are just the ones that I happen to like using. In a video recently, I, I did a kind of a smaller painting. So about half the size of this one and then I'm denied about whether I should put the bricks in. With this one, I decided straight off that actually what I want to do is to uh, put the bricks in. So that's what you see me doing. So I'm going to put uh, lines in for all of the brickwork. I mean, I'm not counting every brick, but I'm going to try and get them in kind of roughly in the right place. And uh, not just to kind of give an indication of the brickwork with a few kind of little scattered lines like I quite often do, but um, to be a little bit more deliberate about it. So that's something that I can do when I'm sketching something like this kind of scale. So this is an A5 notebook that I'm working at, uh, but it's not something I'd try if I was working smaller. Now I drew in the top curve of this window and it's a beautiful curve and I overshot it a little bit so I just decided right I'm just going to make the window a little bit bigger. So I'm putting in some lines for the window frames. And then again, I'm going around the top with uh, some of that brick detail. So I'm going to try and get that distinctive shape of the brick working down the side of the window too, where you get some bricks kind of sticking further out and some kind of further in. Now I'm going to work down the side of the building and uh, get my bricks in there. 
I wouldn't look too closely at my bricks and I wouldn't rely on them to hold up a house. But I'm trying to get the sense of kind of two shorter bricks and then one longer one underneath them. And then having the bricks kind of uh, coming out in that distinctive stepped pattern. But then also noting where that pattern is, seems to be broken on this particular building as well. As I get down to the bottom of the wall, there's quite a bit of foliage on my reference image. Uh, so all along the front of the house, there's little flowers and plants. And I want the bricks to kind of fade out so they look like they're fading behind that. So I need to put the foliage in first before I draw the bricks kind of coming down to meet them. Now I can work on the details of the shop front, get the door and windows in and um, all of the shop signs as well. So once I've got the basic rectangles in for the, the door frames and the window frames, I can put in the, uh, the bits in between the windows, which I believe are called mullions. I'm sure someone will put me right on that if I'm wrong. And um, yeah, and then not forgetting the, uh, the foliage that's all down the front in front of the, uh, in front of the shop window. And then I'm going to fill in the brickwork around these windows too, uh, which goes behind all of the little shop signs and everything as well. Now coming to do the steps, I can see that the bottom step, I can see quite a lot of the tread of the step, but then when it gets to the top step, it's kind of flat on and I can only see the edge of the step. So I start just by sketching the first few steps out and it's going okay, but it could be better. So what I decide to do is to mark in the far edge of the step for the top, top steps and then put in little dots where I think the nearer edge would be. And I wish I'd done this all the way up because it would have looked a lot better, I think. And then once I've got my dots in place, I can join them all together. But I don't mind that it looks a little uh, higgledy piggledy at the bottom because if you look closely at the reference image, you'll see some of the steps are bent um, and then some of them are kind of hidden in foliage. So, and then, you know, I'm going to put lots of flowers and plants and things behind them and underneath them. So it's, it's not going to be very obvious. And then underneath the steps, there's like a, I don't know if this is a shrub or some, some plants or something. And they've got quite broad leaves compared to the ones that are underneath the window. So I'm just trying to make slightly different marks uh, as I'm drawing the foliage there, just to make it look a little more leafy and less grassy. So I don't want to go too far with the foliage because I want to get this A board in. And then I'm putting in some lines for the uh, house next door and I'm holding my pen a little bit more loosely and I'm being a little bit more sketchy as I put these lines in. 
I still want them to be there and I still want them to be kind of obvious, but I want the main smokehouse to be the focus of this uh, painting. So I want the, uh, the lines on the building next door and the one on the other side as well, just to be a little lighter and a little bit less obvious. And I'm putting in the windows and I'm giving some indications of the brickwork on that uh, other building as well. But again, I'm using my lines quite lightly and I'm being a little bit more sketchy with them. You can see me kind of practicing the lines with my pen before I put them in. And I'm trying to work out if I've got an invisible vanishing point for this uh, building over on the left hand side of the page kind of what angle I need the like the bottom of the window to to be at to, to look natural. So I don't want to forget the details at the top, so I'm putting in this little chimney. And then now I've got the stairs and the railings in on the right hand side of the page. I can put in the brickwork that's behind them. I wouldn't have wanted to put the bricks in beforehand uh, because there's an awful lot of stuff in front of them. So now that's all drawn in, I can put in some bricks. But again, because I want the shop to be the focus of this uh, drawing and because they're behind other things as well, uh, again, I'm being a little bit more sketchy with these and a little less careful about uh, about where my bricks are going. I can also fill in the rest of that foliage that's underneath the steps and behind the A board on the right hand side. Now the foreground is a little cobbled street and I want to kind of give an indication of that without drawing every cobble. So I'm going to draw the odd one or two. Um, so some of them are little ovals and then there's just a few kind of random little marks. I can fill in the top of the house next door, just the roof line. and a couple of little wires going across. Oh, and also television aerial, of course, has to go in. And then I can fill in the details on the shop signs too. So uh, some lines around some of the boards to indicate some of the trim that's on there. And then I'm going to put some lettering on as well. I'm going to put in a few of the posters and other things that are in the shop windows. Although you probably won't be able to see these once I've um, actually done the windows because I'm not going to uh, paint every uh, thing in a different colour. When I come to put in the shop sign, I want to make sure that I've left enough space for all of the letters. So I'm sketching them in with pencil first. Uh, but then I'm going in with my pen and adding in the letters. And I'm trying to kind of put a few little marks on them to indicate that they're serif letters. So they've got little kind of bits on the end of the, the letters and they've got some kind of thickness to them. Now I know that as I go over these with paint, uh, that's going to kind of um, look faded and it's not going to be very obvious. And the actual shop sign has got some white lettering on. So what I'm hoping to do is to add some detail in white at the end. But I do want to get the letters in now and then see how they look. And then I can decide whether I want to do that later on. So 
So I know you probably won't be able to read this because it is actually very, very tiny and I've not been that careful with the lettering, but I'm putting in pretty much what is written on the boards there because it's quite fun. The kippers and the smoked salmon and the smoked eels and the um, other things I don't even know what they are. Now this is in Norfolk and a real feature of the buildings there is that so many of them are made out of flints, uh, so these little round stones. And I didn't, having put all the bricks in, I didn't then want to put in every flint as well, but I wanted to uh, make it look like that's what it was. So over all of the building I'm putting in randomly uh, some little circles. Uh, some of them are kind of full little circles and then some of them are just like bits of circles or little dots or marks. I also put a few on the building next door just to show that that's made of the same type of construction as well and this kind of building is part of a street and part of a wider scene. So just a few little marks and dots and uh, things here and there um, and I'm happy with this sketch and uh, pretty much finished with it now. So now it's time to think about adding some colour. I've got my four colours here and I'm going to mix up different mixes of colours for the different sections. So first of all I'm going to do the bricks. I'm starting with that quinacridone gold um, but it's not okay on its own so I keep adding little bits of the Payne's grey and the crimson. The Payne's grey will kind of mute the colours and the crimson will make them more kind of orangey red. And just keep adding different quantities of the colours until I get a brick colour that I'm happy with. And then I can start painting in the brickwork. Now the brush that I'm using today is a size 6 round brush and it's actually a sable brush uh, but it's really really soft. So it comes to a very fine tip which I thought would be really good for the details but actually it's it's so soft that it's really easy just to kind of kind of press down too hard on the tip and paint over a bit that you didn't want to. So I think I should have changed it out for painting some of the smaller details. As I keep painting the brickwork, I keep altering that colour just a little bit because the bricks aren't all one colour. So at some point I'll add in more gold, at some point I'll add in more crimson and at some point I'll add in more Payne's grey and just alter the tone of the bricks as I'm painting different bits. For the house next door I use the same brick colour for the brick areas and for the roof uh, but I've watered it down a little bit so it's a little bit lighter, a little bit paler. That's again just because I don't want this building to be the focus of the painting but I want it to be obvious that it's kind of part of it, it's still there. If you wanted to you could just leave this without any paint on it and that would look quite fun as well. And I like to survey the picture to see if I need that colour anywhere else. Um, and I realised that that kind of warm colour is in front of the shop as well. So I, uh, again, use a kind of watery consistency of it and just kind of paint that into the ground, not going too far into where the foliage is. But then it kind of fades out into something a little bit more neutral. So I'm using that buff titanium and then I'm just going to fade it out towards the bottom of the picture. Now I'm going to mix up a colour for the uh, the shop sign and the closest colour I've got to it is this uh, buff colour 
uh, which is kind of creamy colour. But if you've got like a, a brown and you can water it down, or even if you've got an opaque white and you can mix that with the brown, you'd get something similar. I add a little bit of the crimson to it uh, because the colour's not quite right. It's more of a kind of plaster colour. And then it needs neutralising a little bit, so I add some of the Payne's Grey into it. And then I get a colour that I'm really quite happy with. I'm going to paint that all over the shop sign. Now that buff titanium is actually is quite an opaque colour for a watercolour. So it is going to make my writing uh, kind of fade a bit into the background. But I plan to go over it again anyway. Uh, towards the end, so uh, we'll we'll see what it looks like when I get to that point. Now this is the point where I really wish I'd switched to a smaller brush for these very fine details, as I go around the windows. I had a little bit more of the Payne's Grey and some of the Quinacridone Gold into that mixture, which is kind of giving me a creamy, greeny, grey colour that I'm going to use for the uh, stonework. As I start adding it to the main shop, I decide it wants to be a little bit darker, so I just add a little bit more of all of those colours in. I'm just mixing all of my colours together at this point, which will give me a kind of muddy grey colour. And I can add bits of different colours to uh, to make it warmer or cooler, and, and to give me different tones of it. And I'm going to use different kind of tones of that colour um, all over the uh, the flint work in this wall. I'm adding a little a few dabs more of the Payne's Grey into that mix and then um, adding it into the flint wall at various points. Again, just to give it a bit of a, a different colour and then mix a little bit more water into that same colour for the house next door. Add a little bit more Payne's Grey into that mix, which will give me a much cooler grey that I can use for painting the metal steps. The Payne's Grey is really quite powerful. There's a lot of pigment in it. So it can be really easy just to kind of dip your brush into it and completely change the tone of what, your, uh, what you've got on your palette. Now I'm going to paint the foliage. So I've used some of the quinacridone gold and I've added a tiny bit of Payne's Grey into it to make me like a really vibrant lime green. And I'm going to paint like a first layer of the foliage with this. I will go over it again with a, a darker green in some areas to give me some different tones of green. But this is kind of a nice kind of base colour that can go over everything. So I spent a little time trying to mix a nice kind of turquoisey green colour for the rest of the woodwork. Um, and I try a few different things out, but I've got the wrong combination of paints on this palette. I don't really have like a really bright, vibrant blue. So I'm never going to get a really vi bright, vibrant green. So I can mix up something that's kind of like a JD turquoise, but actually it's going to be really muted. Really gorgeous colour, but not what I want for this. So I've got this little pan of Viridian that uh, is from my professional Windsor & Newton watercolour set and I've hardly ever used it because you've got to scrub the paint so much to get any pigment out that it becomes like really difficult to use. But actually it was the perfect colour for this, it hardly needed changing at all. I added a little bit of the buff titanium into it just to kind of calm it down a little bit and to give it that kind of chalky feel. And then I paint over the woodwork 
And I know that this is going to need a couple of coats because that paint is so transparent. Now I've mixed up a darker green, again the paint's grey and some of that quinacridone gold and I'm putting it especially towards the base of the foliage and then lots of it underneath the steps over to the right where you can see it's quite dark on the reference image. Now I want to mix up a really dark colour and I'm kind of working with the dark green that I've already mixed because it's already kind of nearly there. I add a lot more Payne's Grey into it and I'll get myself a nice kind of, yeah, really deep dark colour that's just going to complement the rest of what's on the, on the page. And for this I'm going to paint in the windows. Again, I should have used a different brush for this because I wasn't too happy with how messy they were in the end. So I've mixed up quite a dark colour to start with, but you'll see that the watercolour dries much lighter than it goes on. So even though I've put on quite a dark colour to start with, I end up going over this with the second coat because I feel like there's not enough differentiation between the uh, the colour of the uh, the inside of the windows and the outside of the building. So I'm going to use some of that same colour again to deepen the foliage, um, deepen that area underneath the steps on the right hand side. And then I'm going to use uh, a little bit of it to add some shadows as well, uh, especially under the eaves of the building to the right and anywhere else that I think there would be a shadow, so underneath the shop signs and that kind of thing. This is quite a flat image because it was quite an overcast day, so there aren't too many shadows to work with, but there are a few and just adding them really does add kind of depth and dimension to your to your painting. I'm going to add a little shadow on the inside of the door there and then just use a damp dried paintbrush just to blend the edges of that shadow so it doesn't look harsh. And then I use the same colour to create like a chalkboard on the A-frame outside the shop. So I decided I do want to go in with some white on the shop sign. So I'm using my Posca marker um, and the one that I've got here, um, it's, it's, it's going over the pen all right, but uh, it's not looking very bright and it's not looking very kind of crisp. So, so I get a new pen. So again, it's Posca pen, uh, but it's just, it's a new one and it's not been open quite as long. And then I want to add in the shadow around the letters. So just to the left and to underneath of every letter, I'm going to go in with my black pen again. And I've switched to a slightly finer one. I think this is a 0.1. And I am just putting in the details of the letters with that. Again, it makes them a little bit more obvious. So thanks very much for watching today. I really hope that you've enjoyed this. If you do give this a go, I'd love to see the results. You can post them on Instagram and tag me at Lou Rachel Davis. And I always look forward to seeing what you've made. If you want to follow along, you can download the reference image from my website and there'll be a link for that down below. So thanks once again. If you like the video, then give it a thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more, then do subscribe. 
and I look forward to seeing you again very, very soon. Bye-bye.